Okay, here we go. So we're just going to go in order of the presenters. Uh, and our first presenter is Richard Ray. And Richard, you can start now. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, the paper I circulated is on interpretive permissions. And while a lot of it talks about statutory interpretation for obvious reasons, I'm gonna try to pitch my remarks here more in a constitutional register, uh, apart from the occasion of our gathering, I just think I could use some more help with the constitutional part of the argument. So by interpretive permission, what I mean is a principle that uh, dictates that certain legal outcomes are allowed without foreclosing the possibility that other legal outcomes could also be allowed. And I take inspiration uh, in talking about uh, interpretive permissions from the basic rules, which uh, have traditionally been thought to govern statutory interpretation in the United Kingdom. And if we were to kind of translate the basic rules into constitutional interpretation, I think what you might end up with something, something like the following, which would be an example of a, of a set of interpretive permissions that we might consider. So the first uh, basic rule is the literal rule. And uh, as applied to the constitutional interpretation, you might say that, that a judge is allowed to interpret the constitution as they think it is best um, understood textually. And then you might complement that with the mischief rule, which provides that the judge is also allowed to interpret the provision uh, in light of the specific actual goals that the historical legislators or lawmakers had in mind. And then finally, uh, the golden rule, which provides that you uh, are also allowed to interpret the provision in a way that would avoid uh, outcomes that, that there basically would be a consensus uh, are, are very harmful or senseless or irrational. Uh, and so if you, if you kind of step back from the basic rules for a second, I think one way to, to, to gloss them is that the literal rule as applied to constitutional reasoning will often, not always, but will often come across as a kind of um, almost Dorkinian um, delegation to the future in the sense that if you look at some of the open-ended provisions of the constitution, it seems like a judge could say, well, my best reading of equal protection is, is blank. And so it would allow for a, a lot of judicial creativity. Uh, and then you look at the mischief rule and it looks like something like what I guess now gets called um, old fashioned originalism, where you construe the text in light of what was actually was going on at the time when the provision was created. And then you look at, at the golden rule and uh, it, you could either view that as a kind of um, pragmatic escape valve uh, and or you could view that as, as a, an expression of the idea that you often see or used to see more often that certain outcomes are just kind of off the table as an interpretive matter because they'd be so deleterious. Like, like the legal tender cases are not gonna be overruled. It could be because of sorry decisis, but it could also just be because it would be catastrophic. And everyone would agree it'd be kind of catastrophic if they were overruled. Uh, it'd be a very senseless, harmful result that no one would want. And so uh, my suggestion is that this basic framework, and you obviously could change it in a variety of ways, but this basic framework has a lot of appeal for us uh, in thinking about interpretation. And uh, so why would that be? So one reason is it seems like the kind of things that the basic rules are talking about are uh, at least plausibly viewed as the fundamental inputs into interpretation. And these are, these are uh, fundamentally different incommensurable inputs, formal texts, legislative goals, and practical consequences are these seem like three categorically different things. Um, and so there's something facially plausible about saying, well, if you are serving any one of those things in a strong way, maybe that's a, a legally allowable thing to do. So there's a kind of, first principles of intuitive appeal to this approach. Uh, so that's one, one point in favor. Another point in favor that I, I think maybe is um, um, more practically appealing today is that we simply have this fact of interpretive pluralism in our legal system where we have Justice Thomas sitting on the same court as Justice Breyer. Before that, we had Justice Scalia sitting on the same court as Justice Ginsburg and they're self-consciously interpreting things very differently in different ways for different reasons. And yet it doesn't seem as though any one of them is violating any governing interpretive principle, or at least not in a way that, that can stop them from continuing to disagree. And, and so what are we supposed to do with this? Um, what I call indeterminacy across interpretive methodologies. And one possibility is just keep insisting that you know, one grand theory is better and should eventually beat all the other grand theories. Another option is to be kind of eclectic about interpretation and try to weigh these incommensurable things against one another in one way or another. And both of those seem like they're not really gonna make a lot of headway. Uh, and they're both very familiar approaches. And I think interpretive permissions offer kind of a third way that may have certain appeal, may have certain advantages over the others. And why would that be? Well, if you have these interpretive permissions, what you're basically providing for is that the different grand theories can compromise on a limited shared set of permissions. So the, the basic rules, for example, rule out posnarian pragmatism. They rule out Hart and Sachs style purposivism, at least as it's caric uh, caricatured. 
uh, and they rule out the exclusivity of textualism. And so what, what you might imagine happening is instead of saying, well, we're just going to write opinions that throw all the different variables in a soup and come out a certain way and say that's the one right answer, rather you say, well, the, the prag pragmatists are going to give up strong pragmatism in favor of the golden rule, et cetera. Uh, and so the idea is that by, by embracing and owning, but also limiting methodological and determinacy, you might actually have greater overall determinacy in the legal system, more predictability, and so forth. So that's another big advantage, I think, to this approach. Um, a third advantage, I think, is that it fosters greater candor about the what I would view as non-legal, but some of you may disagree with me about that, but, but the, I guess, traditionally non-legal bases for rendering a lot of interpretive decisions. So you see in the ends of judicial opinions a lot, you'll have these arguments that seem to be non-legal about the role of courts or uh, you know, something that seems to sound in human dignity or something like that. And, and it seems to me that if we have these permissions, there's greater opportunity for judges to say, look, I'm deciding this way, partly for moral reasons or issues of political justice. And that's why I'm picking this permission over others. And so there could be greater candor and transparency uh, in terms of what, what is underlying the methodological choices that jurists are making. Okay, and the last advantage I'll say briefly uh, is I like that the permissions create room for judicial supererogation, what I, for outcomes to be supererogatory. And what I mean by that is um, in the, if you have a one best answer view of, of legal interpretation, then what inevitably seems to happen is one judge says, I'm right and you're wrong. And um, even if there's a kind of indeterminacy, you say, well, I'm a little, my, my view is a little bit better. But if you have um, it permissions, it becomes possible to say that some inputs into legal decision-making don't render things permissible as opposed to impermissible. Rather, within the zone of permissibility, they render certain outcomes praiseworthy or really great answers. And in, in you know, ethical theory, it's very common to say that you know, people have a, uh, it's permissible to value the good of all people equally, but it's also permissible to value yourself, your family, and your friends a little bit more. And if you're, it so happens that you value yourself you know, not too much and other people more, that's super derogatory. You're, you should be praised for that. But if you go the other way, you shouldn't be blamed. You shouldn't be criticized or punished. And I think there's a similar room for interpretation and certain inputs into interpretation that permissions allow. And my best example of that, I think, is the idea of precedential reasoning. I think it's very common in our legal system to say, well, such and such outcome isn't actually governed by the square holding of a precedent, but it's supported by the reasoning of that precedent or maybe a bunch of other precedents. And when we talk like that, we aren't really saying that the judge has to rule in, uh, in a manner consistent with the reasoning of the cases. I think what we're saying is it would be better that would be the legally better praiseworthy result, but the other outcome is also on the table. Uh, and I like, the, I like that the permission uh, framework creates room for that kind, of, um, that kind of allowance. So I'll say one more thing is I, I don't wanna go on too long for a bunch of reasons. I wanna get your feedback in so many ways. I will say one other thing, uh, since Steve is, is here, I know, and the work, the paper kind of ends talking a bit in particular about some of Steve's uh, research. So another claim I make in the paper uh, that, that um, I'm gonna be curious to get reactions on, is the idea that if you look at at least original methods, originalism, the idea that we start constructing our interpretive theory by looking at the interpretive methods of the, of the um, original lawmakers, it strikes me that there's at least a plausible argument that there are a lot of interpretive permissions built into founding your interpretation. And I'm not sure when those permissions would have gone away. And so one argument I make about that has to do with the equity of the statute that's been well ventilated in the literature and other contexts. And another argument is simply about the, the uniqueness of the constitutional document where there were lots of canons of interpretation or principles of interpretation before the creation of the constitution, but many, many people, as, as some people I see here in the, in the, in the Zoom have, have written extensively on uh, long before I got interested in this topic, there was a lot of debate about whether the constitution was a fundamentally new legal document and uh, to the extent it was, what kind of pre-existing interpretive principles applied to it. And the fact that that was an open issue, indeed an issue of intense controversy at the founding, suggests to me a kind of weak permission to choose among those interpretive methods. When I say weak permission, I mean there simply wasn't a governing principle to tell you what to do. Okay, so I've said a lot of stuff. Again, I look forward to all of your thoughts and I'll stop there. Thanks, Larry. Great, thank you. And thank you for being under time. Uh, so Jeremy uh, Tellman is next. Thanks, Larry. Um, and thanks to the hosts uh, for facilitating this. Oh, I wanted to share my screen. Whoops, there we go. So um, it's really a pleasure for me to be part of this panel 
uh, with such interesting and stimulating papers and to have Larry Solomon to comment on the papers. Um, and I'm confident that my work will benefit from your comments. Reading Steve Sachs's paper for the conference, it struck me that our areas of agreement are much far more substantial than our areas of disagreement. I'm a huge fan of his work and of Will Bode's work. Uh, I always find their explications of particular constitutional provisions instructive and persuasive. Um, we also are largely uh, agreed about the appropriate methods of constitutional interpretation. But Stephen will call that method original law originalism, and I call it pluralism. The area where we disagree is that Will and Steve, while open to different interpretive modalities, arrange those modalities in a hierarchy with originalism at the top, while my view is that our tradition of constitutional jurisprudence has largely been pluralist, but non-hierarchical. So we largely agree about methodology, but disagree about terminology in one area. In another area, we agree about terminology, but disagree on substance. Will and Steve present themselves as positivists. I too regard myself as a positivist, but I'm not convinced that they are. Part of the problem is that I'm more of a Kelsenian than a Harshian. So I'll spend a few moments today explaining why from a Kelsenian perspective, what Will and Steve offer is not positivist. But I'm also convinced that their project is not part positivist from a Harshian perspective. In addition, there's an empirical problem with the way they characterize our constitutional jurisprudence. I don't find it plausible to argue that judges are bound by inclusive originalism because inclusive originalism has always been our law. Uh, as I already noted, to many people, inclusive originalism looks a lot more like, uh, a lot like non-originalism. And so for that very reason, even some originalists would not accept that inclusive originalism is our law. Finally, Stephen's ex Steve's exchange with Andrew Cohn reveals a that uh, the substantive commitments that underline Will and Steve's adherence to originalism. Andrew imagined a constitutional amendment requiring that courts adhere to originalism. Steve wrote a response. I would have expected him to say that such an amendment wasn't necessary because originalism is already our law. That wasn't his approach. Rather, because Andrew also imagined an amendment requiring that courts adhere to non-originalism, Steve conceded that such an amendment was conceivable, but argued that it would lead to terrible outcomes. So notwithstanding their protestations of positivism, when push comes to shove, Steve at least is an originalist because he thinks originalism is a good thing, whether or not it is our law. And that's a good thing too, I argue, from a positivist perspective, uh, since it's not our law, and I doubt that originalism is the kind of a thing that can be law. So to get into um, um, my criticism of Bowdoin Sachs's uh, inclusive originalism, first, from a Kelsenian perspective, it's clear that originalism cannot be our law. For Kelsen, as for most positivists, a rule uh, um, uh, sorry, law is a rule generated by an authority empowered to promulgate rules. But courts are not such authorities for Kelsen. They, they don't generate high level norms, but only individual norms that resolve particular cases. Originalism, if it were a legal norm, would have to be established by a lawmaking authority. And as Andrew Cohn's thought experiment demonstrates, it hasn't been. Second, Kelsen defines law as a rule coupled with a threat that a consequence will follow from a violation of the rule. There is no penalty for non-originalist jurisprudence. And if no legal consequence follows from the violation of a norm, we're not dealing with a legal norm. I'm not expecting, nor do I think that Stephen will expect that non-originalist judges will be flogged, but there ought to be something. In fact, much of our constitutional jurisprudence has been non-originalist and non-originalist legal opinions have the exact same status as statements of our law as originalist legal opinions have. The last Kelsenian critique 
Although Will and Steve call originalism a theory of change and want to characterize it as a Harshan rule of change, from a Kelsenian perspective, it's just a mode of interpretation and, Ka and Kelsen characterized the law as a frame with no picture. Any mode of interpretation would do so long as could be reconciled with higher norms. Okay, but talking about Kelsen in the United States is a bit of an exercise in pedantry. What really matters is whether Stephen will get heart right. And I don't think they do, primarily because I think they misunderstand the internal point of view. So Hart understood uh, laws to be product of social facts, but social facts only generate legal norms when people abide by them under a sense of legal obligation. As Stephen will well know, there have been numerous normative defenses of originalism. They have made a unique contribution with their audacious claim that originalism is our law. But because even most practitioners of originalism do not think originalism is binding law, even they do not accept originalism as law from the internal point of view. Their conduct is motivated by norms that are not legal norms and are not binding. Um, nor is it clear that, that Hart any more than Kelsen viewed courts as bodies that could generate higher level norms. They might do, but as Richard Ray's paper for this panel illustrates, in the English traditions, the court did not establish one binding law of interpretation. Rather, both England with its Act of Interpretation Act and international law with Articles 31 to 33 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties generated rules for interpretation through statute and treaty, not through the courts. Stephen Will may object that they view originalism as something more than a theory of interpretation, it is a rule of change, but there are rules about rules of change as well. They cannot be generated by just any institution that takes it upon itself to generate a rule of change. I would be interested to hear more from Stephen Will about what body generated originalism as a rule of change and on what basis that body could claim authority to do so. There is an irony to Will and Steve's work. They claim that originalism is a rule of lawful change, but of course, Originalism began its existence as a call for a return to original doctrine. It very much was not a call for change. Theirs may still be a minority view within originalism. And I think that their view that our constitutional jurisprudence can be best understood through the lens of inclusive originalism is just wrong as an empirical matter. Um, I think their mistake here is to conflate rhetoric and substance. Um, and here I can only echo a point that Richard Primus has already made. Here's Richard, kaboom. Uh, Stephen will argue that originalism is our law because the court usually adheres to originalism and never renounces it. Well, on that same basis, Richard Primus argues, one could say that theology is our politics because politicians often embrace religion and never renounce it. And yet theology is not our politics. Politics is our politics, and perhaps it is our law as well. But I prefer to think that our constitutional jurisprudence is the product of people working in good faith to give effect to legislative purpose as reflected in the constitutional text. But often coming to a crossroads where original meaning runs out, and then they appeal to extra legal norms. In some areas where meta-interpretive problems arrive, I have argued, original meaning runs out before interpretation can even begin. In any case, since courts are not the main generators of constitutional norms, I think Will and Steve look for evidence of positive law in the wrong place. The main question is not what courts do, but how do legislative and administrative bodies determine what the law is? My hunch, is that for most of our history, pragmatism rather than originalism has been our law, if one can call it that, especially in the realm of Article II powers. And so while Stephen and I agree on so much, we ultimately arrive at very different understandings of our constitutional history. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you also for coming in under time. Uh, so uh, Jason and Jem are next, uh, take it away.
unmute. Uh, th thanks so much. Uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, present the paper and, and, and uh, Jem is going to field the questions this time. So I want to talk about um, interconstitutionalism, I-N-T-E-R. And the basic question is this, you replace your existing constitution with a new constitution. What relevance does the old constitution have when it comes to interpreting provisions of the new constitution? You might think none, uh, but that isn't the answer that courts and other constitutional interpreters give. Uh, instead of interconstitutional interpretation, the practice of invoking predecessor constitutions when interpreting the current constitution is very, uh, very common. And it raises, um, I think, some complex questions about constitutional meaning, about constitutional change, and about democratic legitimacy, uh, among other things, and with some implications, we think, for theories of constitutional, constitutional interpretation, including uh, originalism. Uh, we're looking um, for now mostly at courts and we're working through three big categories of cases. First, with respect to the federal constitution, cases that invoke, uh, draw comparisons and contrast with the Articles of Confederation. There are lots of these, you've almost certainly seen many of them. And not everyone's gonna like this category because there's some debate about whether the articles should even be understood as a previous constitution. Uh, so the second category is more obvious, uh, state courts interpreting the current state constitution, uh, 30 states um, have had more than one state constitution and state courts deciding constitutional cases routinely look to their predecessor state constitutions for a variety of reasons. And then globally, apex or constitutional courts outside of the United States uh, and the role, if any, that predecessor national constitutions play in interpreting the enforced constitution. We are at a early stage of the overall project. We're planning multiple papers from it and we're still largely in the observational investigative stage. We're certainly not yet ma making uh, normative claims and we're, we're barely even close to doing any um, uh, serious analysis. Um, the draft we turned in some weeks ago for this conference deals with a slice of the project, focusing particularly on state constitutions and state courts and some discussion of originalism. That, uh, that represents one aspect of the project um, and even that draft is being <coughs> substantially uh, revised, including to incorporate some very helpful comments that Larry gave us when we, <coughs> when we presented this uh, in another setting and uh, apologies to him because he's already heard this presentation just a couple of weeks ago. But, but I see that several others who heard this also um, are voluntarily here today. Uh, again, I, I'm gonna think of you as, as, as groupies, I guess. Um, but this is all by way of saying that feedback is, is very helpful to us. So what I'd like to do um, is flag a few things that I think help give a sense of the sorts of issues that we are tackling, and maybe you'll be persuaded that there's something useful here. So first, one big observation. When we talk about the federal constitution, the motto is, has become, we're all textualists, we're all originalists. And when you put on your, um, you know, your interconstitutional spectacles, this turns out to be true to a large extent also at the state level. There have been some studies of originalism in the state courts, but not many. Uh, it's a pretty undeveloped area. It's generally approached to the same framework that applies to the federal constitution. The focus on interconstitutional interpretation uncovers lots of originalist practices going back many years in the state courts um, with a few twists that I'll get to in a second. Even more interesting is that I think attention to interconstitutionalism also shows that courts outside of the United States are far more textualist, historicist, originalist than we've been led to believe. The normal story has been that abroad historical and originalist approaches have not generally been embraced and indeed have generally been rejected. The interconstitutional practices of foreign courts suggest otherwise, but, but again with some interesting variations. Uh, back to the state courts. The state courts that are avowedly originalist have developed and defended some interpretive rules or principles to account for the fact that they are interpreting constitution number two or three or nine or ten um, of the state. Uh, and there are cases that were decided under the predecessor constitutions and the new constitution contains some provisions identical to or similar to provisions of the earlier constitution, even if the new constitution has some different provisions as well. State courts do not just ignore the predecessor constitution and, and cases decided under it and just uh, proceed on a blank slate. Instead, they tend to view uh, predecessor constitutions as not just relevant to determining meaning of the current constitution, but as having something very close to uh, very close to continued legal authority. 
uh, state courts adhere strongly to a principle that uh, Gemini uh, used to describe in Latin, but we now just call constitutional continuity. Uh, so this is the idea that if you adopt a new constitution that repeats language provisions from the prior constitution or a prior constitution, uh, when we as courts determine original public meaning, we look not at the time that the current constitution, what is before us was ratified, but rather its original public meaning as of the time the provision first appeared in a constitution of this state. Uh, in other words, if you retained or repeated language from an earlier constitution of this state, you've also adopted the earlier original public meaning. Um, and some courts say this is the case even with respect to non-technical terms uh, whose meaning to the public today uh, has changed, say because of technological changes um, that have occurred in the background. And the justification is set out in different ways, but one common idea, and the courts say this, is that the meaning the provision had at the time of Constitution 1 is the most important legal context for discerning the meaning of the provision at the time of Constitution 2. This, I think, is a, it's a fascinating idea with, uh, with lots, of, lots of implications. So, so very quickly, think about, the, uh, think about the federal constitution, the Bill of Rights for a second. There's a large and sophisticated and I think persuasive literature that says original public meaning, yes, um, but, but not 1791, 1868, when incorporation occurs, that's the relevant date for discerning meaning of the Bill of Rights provisions. If you're talking about application to the states, at least, the interconstitutional practices of state courts push back on that idea. They say, essentially, uh, even if you go further than amending, you actually adopt a new constitution, meaning should be understood as of time one, unless you specify otherwise. Um, and it turns out that specifying otherwise actually turns out to be uh, a, a hard thing to accomplish. And then another principle from, uh, again, from the state courts especially, and a bit also from the foreign courts, that if you adopt a new constitution that repeats language from the prior constitution, you ratify, constitutionalize all of the Supreme Court or constitutional courts prior rulings construing and applying the provision that you have repeated. If you say due process again, you are incorporating into the new constitution our jurisprudence on due process under the old constitution, unless you repudiate specifically that uh, case law um, in, the, uh, in the new constitution. And some state courts even seem to suggest, even if those prior rulings were wrong, contrary to the original original public meaning, you, we are now stuck with them because readoption of the provision ratifies those rulings uh, in, in, in uh, interpreting it. Um, again, lots of interesting implications, including for anybody who tries to write a new constitution, even if you think the words mean what they mean to you and your contemporaries, they might not. Um, even if you think you were breaking from the past, you might not be. You'd better know what was in the former constitution and what courts said about it because by default it all uh, binds uh, you. Um, now, um, and, and this is just borrowing unabashedly from, from Larry, there might be what Larry had suggested to us as a happy story as to your second constitution that repeats a provision from the first constitution. Uh, and again, here channeling Larry to distinguish between first and second order uh, communicative intentions. There are um, at least four possibilities. One is to convey to the public a certain proposition through the clause of the second constitution. Second, to convey the same content that the same clause and the predecessor constitution conveyed to the public. Third, to convey the content the judges assigned to that clause in the predecessor constitution. Fourth, to convey the original public meaning of the clause in the second constitution. These might all converge, but if they don't, you have to decide which meaning governs. We might want four, um, and I think there's a good justification for that, but the risk is that courts are likely to and seem to gravitate to three, especially if the court is the same court with the same judges you had under the previous constitution. There are lots of cases where somebody argues the new constitution displaces your previous approach judges and the judges say, well, it didn't do so specifically enough and it would be improper for us to impose a, a new meaning um, the sovereign people didn't have when they adopted the new constitution. So all our old case law stays. Um, if we move away from interpretation for a minute, um, there are just a couple of broader points I can just flag. Um, one is role, one is the role of precedent and stare decisis. There's a huge literature, of course, uh, on this, but it all is within the context of a single uh, constitution. States and nations with multiple constitutions um, have to ask also about cases decided under the previous constitution. 
uh, as my dis description uh, of the state court cases suggests, um, the state courts seem to view an intervening constitution that does not repudiate prior cases as giving those cases even stronger stare decisis effect than they had previously um, and, and stronger than new cases um, uh, can even attain under your, uh, under your new uh, constitution. Um, second big point, um, I think goes to uh, issues of popular sovereignty um, and, and democratic constitutionalism. Um, on our account, um, it, it's quite hard um, to break from your past constitutional regime, even if you consciously set out to repudiate it. And so the most interesting material we are getting uh, is from nations where um, there's been, you know, not, not just a sort of orderly desire to update your constitution with something new, but a revolution or some other transformative uh, um, event. Um, and you really want to break from your prior uh, regime. Uh, and yet uh, it continues to sort of live on and have influence. Um, I just hired somebody, for example, who is tracing the, all of the ongoing influence of the Soviet constitutions um, on, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, the, on the Russian courts uh, today. Soviet constitutions, which had, were just sort of meaningless at that time, they seem to actually have more legal uh, effect uh, today. Um, and then, um, uh, and I think I can get this in in my last minute, um, oh, a third piece of this is, I think, also to shed some light on single constitutions that are changed through amendment rather than uh, replacement. Um, I've already mentioned the issue of incorporation, but other points involve repetition of text at different time points. I know Larry's very interested in due process in the Fifth Amendment, uh, then also the 14th. But we also have, of course, privileges and immunities. We have this whole series of voting amendments in the federal constitution, the 15th, the 19th, the 24th, the 26th, separated by a century, but using the same formula, right to vote, um, deny or abridge um, on account of. Um, and so uh, perhaps uh, shedding some, some light on all of that as well. And then kind of last point, you know, really very last point, um, one odd feature of all of this is that you might accomplish less change through replacement than amendment, because if you replace, you might not realize just how much you are probably inadvertently uh, preserving. And so I think ultimately we will have something to say about that uh, as well. And I think I'm a few seconds under. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Steve, you're next. Um, thanks very much uh, for having me and thanks to all of you for coming to listen. Um, so my paper is on originalism as a standard and procedure. Um, in some ways, originalism is the victim of its marketing success. Uh, for a long time, originalism was described as a way of constraining judges, of uh, providing constitutional answers um, that would not be quite so wishy-washy and uncertain as whatever else the judges were doing. But once you start trying to do originalism seriously, you might then be disappointed by the fact that those answers are relatively difficult to find. Um, I have in other works sort of argued about the extent to which those answers really are um, inaccessible or uncertain. But here I argue a different point, which is that it's really beside the point. Um, that whether we can identify the answers in practice is not the same question as whether originalism is the right standard, whether it is the correct theory of what makes right answers right, even if it doesn't identify right answers in as convenient a way as we might hope. This view has certain implications for practice. Um, it suggests uh, that certain kinds of judicial doctrines might be more legitimate than an originalist might otherwise think. Um, shed some light on the interpretation and construction division, um, shows the limits and the strength of various normative defenses of originalism, and might give us a better picture of originalism's actual use in practice. Um, so let's sort of explain in general the critique and the response. So the critique is, is familiar, I think, to most of you. History is really hard to do. Um, Justice Scalia was willing to, con to confess that. Often it's not done very well, even by people who describe themselves as originalists. And moreover, even once you've done all the history, you then have to apply it to current facts. So we might have to ask, in some sense, as Justice Alito did, what James Madison thought about video games. Or if we're not asking that question, we might have to come up with some rule that just James Madison would have endorsed that then has determinate application to video games. And that can be really difficult. And in fact, as the late Frank Cross argued, in practice, you know, justices who identify as originalist or judges who identify as an originalist, you know, vote in as much of an attitudinal model way as anybody else. Um, it might be hard to uh, pigeonhole them with respect to their originalism. So what's the point if it doesn't actually constrain them in practice? The paper responds by drawing on a distinction that's been made in moral philosophy. So uh, Eugene Bales, 
um, in, uh, uh, popularized this distinction with respect to utilitarianism or, or consequentialism more generally. If we don't know what the consequences of our acts are, um, how can we be so sure that making the world a better place is the thing we ought to do? Um, if you're trying to decide whether to save a drowning man, it doesn't seem to make much sense to sit down and calculate all of the benefits and all of the costs. If you do that, by that time, the person will have drowned. Um, and in response to that sort of claim about that, that consequentialism was self-refuting, he said it really depends on what we think an ethical theory is there to do. Is it there to provide the best criterion of what makes right acts right, or is it there to provide a method of identifying those right acts in practice? Um, in certain ways, it might be analogous to certain kinds of scientific theories, recognizing there are lots of other um, differences between them. But if you want to know what makes a substance an acid or a base, your answer is going to have something to do with, you know, being a proton donor or an electron acceptor or something, not about whether it turns litmus paper blue or red. Um, that might be, litmus paper might be the best way of figuring out whether something is an acid or a base in practice, but that's not going to figure in your explanation of what it is to be an acid or a base. On the other hand, your explanation of what it is might tell you how to design litmus paper or why the litmus paper you've designed isn't very good at it. Um, in the same way, um, for originalism, if the question that it's trying to ask ultimately is, you know, what is the law or what is constitutional law on this point, the best theory of what our constitutional law is or what uh, or, or the best theory of what the original constitutional law is might not be the most helpful way of identifying it in practice. Law very often deliberately does things that involve very difficult applications in practice. I give the example of the Assimilative Crimes Act, where we say that you know, the law on a California Navy base might turn on complicated questions of California state criminal law. And we do that not because we like the California state criminal law, or even that we think federal judges are good at identifying it, but because we know we want the two to line up more than we know the content of the actual law. In the same way, we might have good reasons for opaque reference in constitutional law. We might want our constitutional law only to change in particular ways, such that the constitutional law we have today depends in large part on the constitutional law we had at some previous time without knowing very much about what that constitutional law was. Um, it might well be that that's the best theory of our constitutional law today, even if it's not terribly useful on a day-to-day -day basis in picking out particular questions of constitutional law. Um, this responds in some ways both to the historical argument of sort of why would we look uh, in the history and the answer would just be, well, if we haven't changed it, where else are you going to look? Um, and also the questions of application. So if we're worried about trying to apply old law to new facts, that might be something we do all the time. It might be not a uniquely originalist problem. And the fact that judges tend to you know, avoid cognitive dissonance and vote their politics, even if they describe themselves as originalists, might be really a knock on the decision procedures they're using, not on the originalist standard. So it's one thing to say, for instance, um, as uh, Cross's studies, uh, uh, Frank Cross's studies had, that founder quotations do not determine the direction in which a judge will vote. Um, but we might not think that founder quotations are really good sort of defenses against uh, you know, bad motivation. They're, they're not sort of magical, uh, you know, fairy dust that you can sprinkle over an opinion and make it better. They're useful insofar as they achieve a further standard, namely adherence to a pre-existing rule of law. And um, it would not be surprising to us if sometimes they go wrong in exactly the same way that when congressmen make economic arguments, we often see it going wrong in ways that are very well predicted by their pre-existing ideologies and politics and party and so on. But that doesn't lead us to conclude that therefore prosperity is an illusion or therefore economic analysis is totally useless when talking about uh, proposed legislation. So it might well be that um, you know, originalism can avoid some of the critiques that are being made by, referring, uh, by considering it as a standard and not a decision procedure. The paper then turns to whether that move is sort of too isolating. Does it sort of fail to get us far enough? Because no matter what, we still want something for the originalist judges to do in practice or the originalist legislators to do in practice. Um, we still need some procedure that they can follow. And is it possible for that procedure to have in any way an originalist explanation? 
This is a version of what I describe as the objection from cluelessness, um, you know, citing James Lenman's paper on consequentialism and cluelessness, that whatever decision procedure a consequentialist comes up with, it has to have in some sense a consequentialist explanation of why it's there. Um, if the situation facing an originalist is really that of, you know, Bork with the inkblot, that we just have Congress shall make no, and then a complete blank, you know, how can any decision procedure possibly be responding to what the originalist answer is? Um, I offer a suggestion that is in line with some of the suggestions that have been offered on the philosophy side to say that there might be different kinds of oughts involved. There might be what you ought to do from the God's eye view, sort of knowing everything that you would need to know, and what you ought to do given the information and capacities available. Um, it might well be that in a given situation, when you're faced with prospects of consequences, the thing that you really should do to make the world a better place is something that would be absurdly foolhardy to actually try. Um, and likewise with the originalist. So whatever the, the correct originalist answer is whatever it says under the inkblot. But just trying to guess right would be a terrible approach for a judge to take on legal grounds, not just on moral grounds. It might well be that the law forbids the judge to do such a thing or make such a thing legally blameworthy, even though it might be legally correct um, overall. In uh, describing how the judge might proceed, I distinguish between internal decision procedures, the sorts of decision procedures the law already offers, um, such as rules of waiver, party presentation principle, vertical, potentially horizontal start decisis, all of the things that might tell a judge not to decide in the correct way, um, but to decide in some other way that is legally blameless. Um, and external decision procedures, where it's really the decision maker who has to come up with a standard, whether they're a judge or any other kind of official, who has to come up with a approach to use to satisfy an existing standard. That could be a question of how much history to do if we're trying to figure out what the correct originalist answer is, or it could be a question of what assumptions to make once we have a standard we're relatively confident of and are not sure how to implement in practice. I give the example of the original package doctrine for the import-export clause. Um, the words original package are not in the constitution, but it still might make sense for an originalist judge to use a decision procedure like that to try and get at the underlying standard of what's an import and what's just property within a state for purposes of the import export clause. Um, you know, the, the, the paper is not a defense of the original package doctrine, but it gives a sense of how decision makers could legitimately use such things without sort of going beyond their commission as decision makers under a generally originalist regime. Well, what that shows us is that um, we might understand certain problems affecting originalism in practice somewhat differently. So when you think about the interpretation construction distinction, you might say that the, the real debate is not between those who are trying to understand the meaning of the words, such as the word import, and those who are trying to use those words as law, because in some ways everybody is trying to do that. The real distinction and the, the thing that the fight is really over is what are the acceptable kinds of decision procedures that we can introduce to try and apply a standard when we're not really sure how it applies to a given situation? Is it okay to come in with a presumption of liberty as some would have it or a presumption favoring state power and disfavoring federal power? All of those kinds of questions are decision procedure fights more than they are standard fights. And conceptualizing that way might help us understand those fights a little better. It also might give us a sense of what the limits are in the decision procedures that we can come up with. So whatever decision procedure an official comes up with, it has to be within their remit under the law. They have to have legal authority to use that decision procedure. Um, I would suggest that there might be cases where that hasn't been the case. I give the example of uh, Miranda and uh, cite Mitch Berman's work on that, but there might be others and I'd be happy to say more in the Q&A about those possibilities. Um, finally, I wanna note um, originalism in practice. When we're trying to identify whether originalism is our law, and I'll, I, I'll appreciate uh, Jeremy's uh, paper, I'm sort of flattered by the attention and uh, the close reading, um, and I'd have much to, to say about it, but if we're trying to figure out whether originalism is our law, part of what we would want to know is are the judges, are the officials, are the decision makers, are the lawyers implicitly adhering to originalist standards whether or not we agree with their particular decision procedures. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Steve. Okay.
I uh, have slides, which I'm going to share now. Uh, so uh, 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 thanks to the conference organizers and uh, thank you all, Richard, uh, Jeremy, Jason, Jim, and Steve for wonderful papers. I learned so much from these papers. These are all exciting projects. Uh, it's an honor to be able to uh, comment on them. Uh, I'm going to just go through each of these papers in order. So um, uh, uh, Richard's paper on interpreter permissions. Um, so he has a description of the UK approach, right? But what I would like to suggest is that there are many way, different ways of interpreting what judges in um, uh, the UK are doing. Um, uh, Plain meaning, the plain meaning rule seems to me to clearly be uh, going after the communicative content of the text. What about the mischief rule? Seems to me that it can perform two distinct functions. The mischief rule, to the extent that it's talking about an underlying purpose, is relevant to communicative content via pragmatics, that is, as a matter of disambiguation or pragmatic enrichment. That's one function of the mischief rule. The other function of the mischief rule is guidance for implementation in cases of underdeterminacy. That would be in the construction zone. And then there's the golden rule. And uh, 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 there's a lot of debate about the golden rule in the United Kingdom. There are broad and narrow versions. Both of them, though, are defeasibility conditions. That is, they make the meaning that we arrive at from the plain meaning rule and the uh, mischief rule defeasible. Uh, uh, this is uh, to avoid internal absurdity or consequences that are clearly contrary to public policy. So that's a structured version, not a permission version. Um, and uh, this structure would not be permissive in the sense that uh, uh, Richard specifies. Right, The plain meaning rule requires context because literal meaning is sparse. You're not going to get actual communicative content without taking context into extent. So the mischief rule is not really permissive. It's mandatory whether judges know it or not. And if there is underdeterminacy, construction has to occur. There has to be some method of construction. The golden rule, I think, is not um, uh, discretion. The golden rule is the application of practical judgment, equity in the Aristotelian sense. Practical judgment is not mechanical, but the lack of uh, mechanical standards is not the same thing as discretion. Uh, the, the real value of the paper, it seems to me, is the actual theory that Richard proposes, as opposed to whether or not this gets England and Great Britain right. Um, I just want to make a comment here about uh, Richard's appeal to Bobbitt. Bobbitt's theorization of constitutional pluralism is either incomplete or incoherent. The best theoretical framework for Bobbitt comes from Dennis Patterson, uh, who uh, very much influenced Bobbitt's account. Uh, so Patterson says that we have a complex ar argumentative structure. We don't have discretion, but practices of arguments. Bobbitt's view is ultimately a Wittgensteinian view. I think you need a thicker account of uh, pluralism. Uh, it, it's not enough to have this sort of very flat permissive account. Um, then just a couple more points. Transparency is not lost or gained by permission because the grounds for the decisiveness of particular modalities are unarticulated in this view. Um, the, and one very final point, the permissions theory is not a description, it's a normative recommendation. But Richard compares his normative recommendation to the status quo, which is just messy and not under theorized. So this is comparing apples and oranges. What we need to do is compare ideal theories to ideal theories or non-ideal theories to non-ideal theories, but comparing the ideal to the non-ideal just is it won't, that doesn't make sense. It's sort of conceptually incoherent. Okay, Jeremy Tellman, which part of our law is originalism? Now, I don't think Jeremy, see, Jeremy is going to like this advice, but I strongly suggest to Jeremy that he lose the Kelsen in, in, in this paper. The exposition of uh, 
Kelson, just you don't say enough for anyone who doesn't already know Kelson to even understand what Kelson is doing. Um, and uh, it divorces Kelson from the neo-Kantian framework, which in my opinion, you may disagree, is absolutely necessary for Kelson to make sense. So you'd have to have a lot of explanation of the deep structure of Kelson's theory. So if you wanna do Kelson, I suggest you make it a separate paper, right? That, and, and I think that will make this paper much stronger because Kelson is really a distraction for almost, not all, but for almost all your readers. Um, so uh, uh, you say all versions of positivism require a body with the authority to promulgate law uh, that provides the source of legal norms. So. I don't think this is correct. Customary law is law. Hart has an explanation for what, why that is in, in the case. But more importantly, this is not, it's not the sources thesis that's important here. It's the rule of recognition. And the rule of recognition is not a law. It's a social norm. So the real question is whether the rule of recognition at the founding included some form of originalism and whether the rule of recognition today is say is the same, whether there's continuity in the rule of recognition, same as it was then. And I think that's a much more fruitful line of inquiry when engaging Bowden Sachs. If the rule of recognition has not changed, then Bowden Sachs are correct from a Harshan perspective. Uh, uh, if we have the same rule of recognition now, that we did then, then the original law, including the change rules, is our law today. That is original law, originalism as they define it. But that doesn't mean that something like public meaning originalism or original methods originalism is our law. That requires that you actually uh, uh, have some account of what uh, the law was then. Um, I guess skip to my next slide. Uh, so Jason and Jam. Um, so uh, I think you might uh, usefully think about types and tokens here. So a sentence token is the use of a sentence on a particular occasion. A sentence type is all of the sentences which have the same words in the same order with the same punctuation, right? So th th we've got a type uh, expression type versus expression token problem here. When two different constitutions use the same sentence token, uh, use sentence tokens of the same type, do they mean the same thing? That's your question. Not necessarily the same sentence uttered in a different context can have a very different meaning, right? Lots of examples of that, including the due process clauses of the Fifth Amendment and the 14th Amendment of the United States. Constitution. Uh, Jason has already previewed my second comment, which is about first order and second order communicative intentions. A first order communicative intention is the intention to convey a proposition with a content via the uttering of a sentence. A second order communicative intention is the intent to convey the same proposition, could be, could be. This is one second order communicative intention, P with content C by the, via the utterance of S2 at T2, S was conveyed by the utterance of S1 at T1. That is the uh, intention, for example, to convey the same meaning via the due process clause in the 14th Amendment as was conveyed by the uh, due process clause in the Fifth Amendment. So there may be a discoverable fact of the matter about first and second order communicative intentions if they mesh if these first order intentions and second determinate order intentions mesh, then we've got the meaning, right? But the difficult cases arise when there's a conflict. So for example, the drafter of the second constitutional provision could have intended to communicate the same content, same proposition as was communicated by the prior provision, but it could turn out that in fact, the meaning is different. Um, there could be a conflict between two different second order communicative intentions, right? So the drafter of the second provision could have intended to communicate the public meaning 
uh, uh, of S2 and to communicate the same meaning as was communicated to the public by S1, but those two meanings can come apart. So these are, these are difficult problems. And I just wanna say that what is happening here is misfiring of constitutional communication, right? There's a failure of communication. And from my perspective, using sort of the construction zone terminology, that means we have a uh, uh, have to have a theory of what we do. It's not a theory of what the provision meant because communication has misfired. Stephen Sachs. Uh, Steve, God, another great uh, Sachs paper. They, these were all great papers. It's a big and ambitious project. I, all I really wanna do is give you some things I think that you might think about. I think this project is probably at a fairly early stage. Um, so um, the idea of a decision procedure for ethics comes from Rawls's famous 1951 article, Outline of a Decision Procedure for Ethics. Um, I really urge you to read this article and compare Bales's treatment of a decision pre uh, procedure with Rawls's, and especially the last, say, six or so paragraph of Rawls, um, where he talks specifically about the idea that decision procedures are not mechanical, that we might be, that we have to expect a decision procedure to be able to do what they can actually do, right? I think that you're going to get a much better and uh, more fully theorized idea of what a decision procedure is from Rawls than you got from Bales. Um, I just want to point out that if you open the door to moral philosophy, I'm sort of surprised to see you opening this door, Steve. Then uh, you got you got to get uh, uh, you you're also opening the door to the particularist critique of uh, the kind of approach that Bales has. So you know you might want to think about that. Uh, uh, Dancy would be the I think the the primary advocate of moral particularism. I think that there is in constitutional law a version of this theory, constitutional particularism, which I don't think you would welcome. But by making sort of the law uh, a, an extension of the same problems in moral philosophy, you're sort of opening the door to this kind of critique of your uh, position. Second thing, I think you would benefit from looking at a, a Hare's two-level theory, right? It's in um, the, the, his full statement of the theory is in Moral Thinking, his 1981 book. So there's the critical level. So in your case, the critical level in Hare's two-level approach would be originalism. And it's the best version of the theory as it would be applied by an ideal originalist judge. Hare uses an archangel here as the uh, representative of, of the perfect utilitarian versus the intuitive level. This is the set of judicial practices that would get real world justices as close as possible to what originalism requires. That, that could be not very close, right? Because it might be that uh, folk uh, judging is sort of the best that real world judges can do. Um, I think this parallel between Hare's view and your view will help you think this problem through in an interesting way. Um, and uh, I'm gonna skip my last slide because I've disobeyed my own uh, injunction to stay um, uh, on time. Okay, so uh, if you have questions, then you can type Q in the chat. I will keep the Q. I hope we have lots of time to get in questions, 33 minutes. So uh, uh, just uh, put a Q in the chat. If no one puts a Q in soon, I will call on the panelists to respond to each other. Uh, Mitch. Thanks. Uh, you guys can hear me OK? Yep. Uh, great, great set of papers uh, and presentations. Really excellent comments by Larry also, of course. Uh, I've got a, a whole bunch of thoughts of, let's see, I'll, I won't take up time with all of them, so I'll just sort of scatter sh shoot a, a few of them. Uh, I guess to, to Steve Sachs, uh, I'd be interested in knowing how you think your 
your distinction between standard and procedure uh, compares and contrasts with the distinction I put forth between prescriptive theories and constitutive theories. It sounds a lot like it. Uh, I'm not, don't mean to suggest my vocabulary is better, uh, you know, but it is out there. So I'd be interested in, in knowing how you think the accounts uh, compare or contrast. Uh, I also think that I, I'm with you, even subject to, uh, to Larry's criticisms and suggestions. You know, I'm, I'm basically with you. I think originalism is better understood as a theory of legal content, is the way I would put it. Uh, but that's not the way all originalists view it. And I do think in the paper, you sometimes move between a view of how it's best to be viewed and a view of sort of an empirical claim that this really is what's going on in originalist theory. You know, it's not McGinnis and Rappaport. Uh, I mean, it's not a lot of folks. It's, just, it's not a lot, a lot of folks. So I, I think that insofar as you could be more emphasizing, this is one way of viewing originalism. I think it's actually a minority view. Well, I'll take that. I'll, I'll rescind that. But in any event, it's certainly not the only view, as you know. Uh, Um, I also think you might want to think about on the interpretation construction distinction, playing around a little more seriously with the possibility that interpretation would be better conceived as the, acti the activity of trying to discern the law as it exists at the time of decision, and construction then is the activity of crafting doctrines that have the right sort of instrumental relationship to enforcing that law. I recognize, of course, that's not Larry's way of of uh, parsing it, and he certainly has a certain type of privilege here as uh, the person most most responsible for really pressing the distinction. But nonetheless, it's not the only way of distinguishing it. Uh, so both Mark, Mark Greenberg, Kevin Toe, and I are all in print as liking something like an interpretation construction distinction, but thinking that it's more perspicuous to identify in interpretation wow. as the activity of trying to discern legal content. So we would here distinguish legal interpretation from linguistic interpretation, where the activity of trying to discern existing legal content uh, involves, among other things, linguistic or communicative interpretation, but we wouldn't want to reduce legal interpretation to communicative or linguistic interpretation. Again, that's something that uh, Larry and I disagree about. Um, uh, so Mitch, um, yeah, I'll shut up. The, the, the organizers asked uh, me to limit people to one question. So, um, uh, 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 let you can get back on the queue. Uh, with, and then look at, at as of right now, you you will get back on the queue for sure. uh, Steve. Do you want to respond to Mitch? Oh, n not at the moment, except to say thank you. And um, in particular, if you have thoughts on on my use or misuse of the Miranda example, please let me know. Uh, David. Yeah, hello, I'm Dave O'Dell. Uh, I uh, wanted to make a comment about, uh, or actually make a potential connection for you, Jason, with uh, uh, a guy here in Georgia who is on the Supreme Court, Nels Peterson. Uh, and he has been very interested in this question, and he and I have gone over this uh, question of these state constitutions being uh, adopted uh, in different forms, uh, and then taking on characteristics of earlier constitutions, your concept of interconstitutional interpretations at the state level. So I did want to introduce you to Nels Peterson, if you don't already know him. He's a really smart guy, Harvard Law grad. He and I were uh, co-counsel in the Obamacare case uh, uh, for the state. And uh, and I, I think I really liked in your paper the fact that you offered some quite a few very interesting factual situations where these questions come up. In Nell's role on the Supreme Court, he's probably been there, I don't know, maybe six or seven, eight years, something like that. Maybe maybe not that long, maybe a little less, five years maybe, but he's developed quite a lot of actual uh, cases in, that really call into quite great relief some of the issues that you're bringing to the fore. And I think that he might help you from a judge's perspective to know how they are are not necessarily required to uh, deal with this, but how they're challenged to deal with this, these kinds of questions. So I thought it was a great paper, very interesting question. 
uh, Nellis is actually going to be presenting uh, this to our uh, state uh, constitutional law section for the State Bar of Georgia, of which I'm chair. And uh, so he uh, he's a guy to talk to. <laughs> just saying, Nels Peterson, I can introduce you to him if you want, or you can just send him an email at the, the Supreme Court of Georgia. Jim, did you want to make a comment about that? Just a comment that I'm not at all surprised, and I think Jason will share this, because um, our golden case, as we call it, with Jason actually comes from the Georgian Supreme Court in 2019. It's Elliott B. State that actually, it's, it's, it's the most prominent decision that we've been able to locate so far that not only employs interconstitutional interpretation, but actually talks about, is conscious about its uh, deployment of that um, interpretive practice. So I'm not at all surprised, and uh, that's that's we'd be uh, very happy to be introduced. I think that was Nell's case. Glenn. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. I had a question for Richard, and and I really like this idea of interpretive permissions. But when I read the paper, I kind of think that this is the uh, system we already have, um, because of interpretive pluralism and the possibility for practical reasoning and interpretation. And by the way, I read Eskridge and Fricke as not providing a single right answer approach, but rather as providing a method for ascertaining sort of the best answer or the most justifiable answer. So um, I'm just, I'm thinking that as you work on your revisions, you might wanna at least think about the possibility that this is um, what we have, or at least um, a prominent theoretical strain that already exists within the debates. Um, and, and if I may, I had um, a, a suggestion for Jason and, and Jam, which um, is that I think there's some really um, potentially good um, analogies that you could think about from the realm of statutory interpretation. Um, and so my understanding was that uh, Anita Krishna Kumar was doing a project on what she calls statutory history which is sort of looking at how statutes are amended over time and then what courts sort of do with that when they interpret contemporary statutes, which seems very similar to what you're talking about. And along the same lines, um, Deb Wittes has some really interesting work on what she calls shadow precedent in the statutory interpretation context where courts will like continue to apply old judicial precedent that was seemingly superseded by um, new statutory amendments just because they don't know that the, the law has been updated and whatnot. Um, so those are just some other lines of research that could be helpful for you. And there's no one else on the queue right now. So uh, uh, if any of the uh, panelists would like to make a comment now about each other, or anything I said, and then we'll let Mitch back in uh, uh, after we, we do that round, unless others uh, um, uh, uh, come back. Uh, Andrew. Uh, would Richard and Jim like to respond uh, to Glenn's comments before I ask a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, thank you for the reminder, Andrew. Uh, would you, Jim? Uh, I could just briefly note that I, I think those are the, 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 uh, the shadow precedent and the contemporary statutes points are well taken. Uh, I would only query whether there's, I mean, I think those are helpful in the sense that, again, there is the um, favor of that I think appear in the interconstitutional interpretation realm as well. Uh, but I wonder whether, whether there's something distinctive about interconstitutional interpretation in the sense that there is an exercise of sovereign authority and in in constituent authority, which is presumably um, different than amending a constitution, let alone um, amending a statute, and whether that should have any sort of special implications. And we found in our work that sometimes it, it doesn't, and that's surprising, and Jason already touched on this, um, and, and again, in the Georgian context, for example, um, the fact that in our constitutional interpretation and all these past precedents and past Georgian constitutions make, they, make their way into current constitutional adjudication, despite the current Georgian constitution's abrogation clause, making it express that all previous um, Georgian constitutions and amendments thereto have been repealed, I think is of special importance. And it strikes me as really 
you know, the question arises then, what is the use, utility, if any, of these abrogation clauses of, um, of replacing a constitution? So I guess the failure of communication problem that Larry, um, um, uh, as Larry put it, is sort of intensified um, at the level of constitutional replacement, but we definitely do observe it in the other two contexts that you that you've helpfully mentioned. Thank you, Andrew. Great, thanks. Um, thanks for these terrific presentations. My question is for uh, Steve, uh, and uh, I. You begin part two point three point one of the paper. Um, by saying that if originalism is the right standard for reasons independent of its usefulness in practice. And I'm, my question is, how much uh, does the project as a whole and the utility of this distinction that you propose between standard originalism as standard and originalism as procedure depend uh, on the existence uh, of reasons independent of usefulness, uh, its usefulness in practice for thinking uh, that originalism is the right standard uh, and um, uh, and I'm wondering if you could spell out what sort of reasons might fit this bill um, apart from uh, your own positivist uh, uh, account. Uh, my hunch is that many non-originalists find the practical objection that you set out to respond to uh, so compelling because they have difficulty conceiving of plausible non-consequentialist reasons for thinking that originalism is the correct standard for interpretation. They don't think originalism is our law, nor do they think that it's required by popular sovereignty. They don't think it's required by the nature of interpretation or writtenness. So are there other reasons that you have in mind uh, why, you know, independent of the usefulness of originalism in practice, why we might nevertheless think it the correct uh, standard uh, for interpretation to pursue? Um, and if not, if this is the, the full uh, range, um, how much progress do you think it's possible for your standard uh, procedure distinction to make uh, against the practical objection without simultaneously making headway on these other uh, fronts. So thank you. I, I would say um, it is somewhat uh, necessary to the project, not 100% necessary. So, you know, I have my own theory of why originalism is legally required. Um, other people have other theories. Other people have theories about why originalism is normatively required, even if, you know, whether it is or is not legally required. Um, and um, some of those work better or less well, um, given the circumstances of uncertainty. So for instance, um, I say in the paper that I think that the McGinnis Rappaport sort of welfareist account works less well if what one thinks is the rules that we had from the founding came in through a really useful procedure that was a good sorting mechanism to find good rules. Because if we don't know what those rules are, we can't get their goodness, and we might in fact be misapplying them. Um, on the other hand, normative defenses that look to the allocation of authority among present actors are probably going to do better even if we are uncertain about the past. So if the rule is, hey judges, you should stick to this particular framework because that properly allocates power between you and between other actors in the modern society, that kind of defense will do better as a defense of originalism, even if we don't know what the old stuff was. Um, because at the very least, the judge goes into it knowing that the scope of their remit is limited in certain ways. Um, or alternatively, folks who have made the oath argument, um, you know, whether one has a non-consequentialist obligation to do your best to find out what the original law was, um, that is going to be the same even if we end up not being able to find it very often or something like that. I, I don't necessarily take a position among any of those uh, normative theories. I'm just sort of highlighting that there may be some out there. And you know, for those of you who like normative theories of originalism, here is a concern, and it might tell you which normative theories have the most legs. Anya. Thanks so much. Um, I feel a little bad because this is also a question for Steve, and it kind of uh, follows a little more closely than I'd like on Andrew's question. So, but I think I'm getting at something from, from a slightly different angle, which is I'm wondering, given the difficulties that you're laying out, um, what you think the justification is for proposing originalism as a method of adjudication, as opposed to as a method of historiography. Um, in other words, since adjudication determines the meaning of the law and determines the effect of the law. Um, 
it might make more sense to look for adjudicatory methods that are plausibly implementable by the people charged with doing that. And I, I wonder if there's a little bit of a contradiction in terms in saying uh, that uh, an adjudicatory method can be evaluated independently of its usefulness to practice since judges are government agents engaged in practice. Thanks. Thank you. I, I would start by denying that adjudication determines the content of the law. I would say that the law determines who's an adjudicator and what their responsibilities are. Um, so, you know, to, in my mind, judges aren't unique in any way. And the attention that, that my papers give to judges really is only because the problems most often come up there. But the same problem would arise if you're in the Social Security Administration trying to decide whether to grant benefits on a given claim and some issue over the original law rears its head. Um, the uh, you know, or, or, or indeed, if you're a person in, in private life trying to determine what your legal obligations are, if you think that that should matter to you. Um, the, uh, you know, a judge is required in certain ways to render judgments in conformity with the law. And so they have reason to find out what the law is if they have a plaintiff coming in and asking for a given kind of relief. Um, but it's not clear, and, and Richard Eakins has, has uh, argued this, it's not clear that that gives them any special authority to determine the content of the law. It's just that that's necessary to them doing their job. And in some way, that's kind of the Marbury argument too. Um, the, um, so I, I would say that, that in the same way that ethics, you know, we have, we might have one theory about what we ought to do, you know, from the God's eye view, you know, what is the correct course of action and another theory about how to go about being ethical in the world with our limited capacities and knowledge and so on. Um, you know, the same sorts of theories might arise in the legal framework. I'm not saying that, that you know, legal obligations are moral obligations. I'm just saying that they might encounter very similar problems. And it might well be that originalism for reasons, you know, of, uh, uh, the the so jurisprudential reasons that I've argued, um, you know, based on the the implicit standards that are accepted among those who do law in our society, is the best theory of what our law is. Um, even if that doesn't help us answer the day to day questions in precisely the same way that the incorporations by reference um, that the law does all the time might be the correct account of what the law is. The law. Um, yeah, well, on a California Navy base is whatever California criminal law is, even if we don't know that, even if it's too hard to find out. Uh, Mitch, you had a question for Richard. Only if uh, there aren't others who haven't yet spoken. There's there's no one currently on the and I And I'm the one who was unmuted and caused all that noise before, both with my dog and my typing. And I apologize to all of you. Uh, I guess I'm just a little curious, Richard, on how you, can you, if you can say a little bit more about how you view your, your approach differing from Phillips. So I guess here I, I differ from Larry a little bit. I don't think that Phillips' view is necessarily incomplete or incoherent. I think it's incomplete from a certain perspective. If we want, doesn't deliver all that many of us would want. But I think on its own terms, it's neither incomplete nor incoherent. But I do understand it to be a multi, a pluralist view, which is permissive. Uh, so as you know, his view is these things can point in different directions. And a lot of people want to know, well, what's the legal content? If they're pointing in different directions, I have an account that tries to add up the incommensurables. But, but his view is explicitly permissive then. And that he thinks is a, is a feature, not a bug, as you well know. So uh, maybe I didn't read that portion of the paper carefully enough, which is very likely. But Still, this is an opportunity to just scare you out and saying a little bit more about uh, you, ver Ray versus Bobbitt. Thanks. Uh, yeah, no, I, I love to talk about uh, that. Thank you for that comment. Thank you again, Larry, for your uh, remarks also. I, I think it's kind of a prelude, I'll just say briefly, uh, going back to Glenn's remark earlier, I, I think that the permission, uh, permission approach that I'm talking about here is a species of pluralism, but it's not the it's not the same as other forms of pluralism in general. It's very common to have, and I think this somewhat goes to the, uh, the, another aspect of Glenn's point too. It's very common to have pluralist views that feature an aggregation mechanism that results in at least the possibility of a best or right answer or some answer that is superior from the perspective of practical reasoning. 
And so I think that uh, there's only a kind of a subset of pluralist views that are not just pluralist, but also permissive in the sense that they openly embrace the possibility of multiple uh, lawful opportunities for legal decision making. Now, having said all that, I do agree with you, Mitch, that, that Bobbitt is probably the, the kind of the big name that, that has both of those features. Uh, she's pluralist and permissive. Uh, and I think the big difference has to do with um, the, the kind of the content of the theory at that point. It was like, I think they kind of get categorized the same. But Bobbitt, as far as I can tell, it doesn't really give any, um, he has, he has, if we take the modalities as not just modes of argument, but actually fundamental principles, kind of more along the lines of the basic rules, then he just kind of lays out this, um, this typology and says that it's up to the personality of each judge at one point, he says, to mix and match as they see fit. So a judge could mix and match them by aggregating them. So he actually thinks aggregation is on the table for a judge, or the judge could just pick any one of them. And so I think the advantage of something like the basic rules plus the plus the supererogatory permission I'm talking about, uh, the, the appeal of it, if there, you know, in part would be that it has the greater opportunity to uh, bridge divides and foster compromise when we do, to go back to Larry's comment, a kind of non-ideal versus non-ideal comparison. At that point, I think I think it's I think that's that's the area where the um, uh, the comparison with Bobbitt might, might play out. In other words, even if Bobbitt is right, that the, the, he, his multiple inputs are all valid, which you know, is another point of possible disagreement. Even if he's right about that whole list, we might still disfavor it on non-ideal grounds because uh, it, his, his list is, is so permissive that it would produce a lot of, um, a lot of in, too much indeterminacy, I guess is one way to put it. Whereas the approach to the model of the basic rules fosters the right amount and the right type of indeterminacy uh, pursuant to permissions. I think Lorraine has a question for Steve. Lorraine, you need to unmute. Thank you. Um, so uh, the question that I have is, um, you propose a theory uh, or, or at least justification for a theory uh, based on its rightness and uh, indicating that it's not necessary that it be useful. So then presumably you would be open to theoretical justifications that, that demonstrate it to be not only right, but also useful, is that correct? Steve says yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so then, uh, uh, how would you? How would? How would that? Um, what kind of changes would that make to? Would or would that make any changes to the theory as you have postulated it? To the justification for the theory. Right. So um, this paper is, in some sense. Um, neutral as among different justifications of the theory, except insofar as it shows that some of them will have a better chance of working than others. So, it, you know, if your justification for the theory is non-consequentialist because it, um, you know, best coheres with the implicit standards of American legal practice or something like that, um, or if it, uh, a normative justification along the lines that it is the best way to fulfill one's oath or, um, you know, best allocates uh, political authority in the present, something like that, those will have a better chance of succeeding. If there are other justifications for originalism out there or versions of originalism that show it to be both true and useful, that's great. I, I, have, no, I have no objection. Um, you know, the, 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 and there it would just be sort of the, the happy occurrence that the correct standard would also provide um, useful decision procedures. Um, I, have, I have no sort of commitment to uselessness, um, despite being an academic. Um, but it, it, you know, if it were the case that such that one would be available, that would be terrific. There, no one is in the queue right now. Um, so uh, uh, let me give the uh, panelists an opportunity to respond either to each other or uh, uh, to my comments or to any of the audience comments. And Jeremy, uh, 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 would you, um, make, do you have anything you would like to say? You haven't had an opportunity to get in yet. Um, that's true. I, I haven't really had anything to respond to. Um, I'm, still, I'm still reeling from your suggestion that I take Kelson out of my paper. Um, so, um, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it. Uh, I had a question for Stephen, but so many people have questions for Steve. I'll, I think I'll leave that. Okay. Anyone else uh, uh, on the panel who would like to make a comment? So if it would be possible for me to respond briefly to Jeremy, um, you know, I, obviously this will 
have to be a, a longer you know discussion. Um, I feel a little bit like I, I have Marshall McLuhan right here. Um, but um, you know, I, I, I would say two things. And again, so I'm, I'm going to leave aside the Kelsen discussion for now, just because I think that's a bigger topic. I would say the first thing is that I'm not sure that that it's correct that in my response to Andrew's paper, I adopt uh, a normative perspective. I think that it sort of depends on the specific things that were at issue that he was arguing in his paper and that I was responding to. Um, I, at least I hope there I still maintain the, the very clear distinction that I try to maintain between legal norms and moral ones. Um, but the um, the, the main point of contention, I think, between us is actually on empirics. It's on, are the implicit standards of, um, of American legal practice originalist or not? Um, I think that even if you don't view originalism as the sort of rule that someone thinks sort of you know, in the, you know, you don't have to know that you're doing originalism the way Monsieur Jordan didn't have to know he was speaking in prose. If it's just a sort of summary rule whereby we don't recognize any alternative methods of change. And if you stand up and you say, judge, this is okay because of this constitutional moment or because of this other thing, this common law constitution, like none of those work. Um, whether you're talking to Congress or to uh, lawyers or to judges, then that might yield originalism, even if originalism is not sort of formally stated, a commitment that everyone listens to and that a judge would be slapped down forever denying. And uh, Jen, do you have anything else you would like, or Jason, that you would like to add at this point? Um, maybe just a note about uh, your comment, Larry, and. Um... And that is whether or not the failure of communication problem that you mentioned is um, sort of ampl uh, amplified or not amplified in the comparative context where episodes of constitutional replacement usually happen on a more frequent basis and um, happen with a lot of political baggage, which may or may not render um, some of the you know um, failure of communication scenarios that you outlined, um, you know, um, easily answerable or not. So I have Latin America, for example, in mind where constitutions are replaced with, you know, some frequency. And then there's a lot of political uh, baggage that sort of answers maybe the, you know, makes very clear the communicative content and sort of resolves any problems with regards to there being any failure with, on the part of the framers or the you know, the general sort of political consensus, being able to communicate what they mean by propositions in the, um, in the text to be enacted. So, so in that sense, I guess I'm, I'm still thinking how, um, whether or not the, the, the scenarios and the sort of the four permutations, so to speak, that you outlined are of special relevance to maybe um, the US context and particularly the, at the state level, given that states replace their constitutions usually without any sort of fundamental rupture, maybe save reconstruction, but you know, Georgia has had 10 or more constitutions. Uh, maybe David can correct, correct me on that front, but, um, and you know, uh, most of those episodes of re replacement were obviously um, did not take place in, in, you know, were not accompanied by episodes of political upheaval what, and you know, whatnot. So I wonder whether failure of communication is uh, maybe those concerns can be assuaged by the fact that it's very apparent in some contexts what's being communicated when a constitution is being replaced, especially in other parts of the world. And Richard, did you have any final remarks? Uh, just th thanks to everybody for the for the thoughts, but I'll I'll, I'll end with that. And Andrew. Yes, uh, a quick question for uh, Jeremy in these last uh, few minutes. Um, uh, I'd be interested to hear your response to Steve on the empirical question and to what extent you think the empirical question is actually extricable from uh, the uh, theoretical disagreement about which facts are relevant or which facts count. Yeah, so, you, you know, it, it's kind of a rabbit duck. <laughs> situation with with me and Steve about these things because I, I think he does, he understands originalism so capaciously uh, it overlaps tremendously with what I regard as our you know uh, pluralistic constitutional tradition and then his example again raises um, 
I think Richard Primus's distinction between rhetoric and substance. There's a part in the paper where I say, where I concede, yeah, you, you don't stand up in court and uh, start talking about um, a common law constitutionalism and get very far, but you can, you can, you can create huge doctrines uh, just making pragmatic arguments, making precedential arguments, making historical arguments, um, appealing to the facts, um, and never touching or going anywhere near, near um, uh, even the capacious version of, uh, of, of originalism. So, um, so I, I think we're seeing the same thing. We're just characterizing it a little bit differently. And then I do think there is a, a tension in terms of uh, uh, rhetoric versus, versus substance. So we have only a few seconds left. So I think maybe the, this is the time to end the panel. And I hope that everyone will join me in either unmuting and applauding or silently applauding the speakers for what were really tremendous papers. Uh, I certainly got a lot out of this session and these papers. So uh, uh, I am very appreciative. And with that, I think we are done. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, everyone. 15 minute break now. <laughs>